Francis and Stuart. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's ruined as well. <laughs> um, I was given a title. Everyone else had sophisticated titles relating to archaeology, etc., etc. My title was Geophys, of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's certainly going to be number one, it's certainly going to be number two, and it's certainly going to be number three. Unfortunately, we're not going to have the adverts, we're not going to have the flashing images. If somebody could get me a beer, I'll be quite happy. <laughs> And if there's any offers for the final bit, <laughs> talk to me later. <laughs> so there I am, wedged between these two star speakers of landscape studies. Francis needs no introduction. Oh, th this is Stuart, by the way. <laughs> it's uh, the largest photo I could find of him. <laughs> A few words about Mick. You heard lots of stories yesterday. Mick actually wanted to become a policeman. This was his desire. So he believes I just want to say a few words about Mick. He had a great influence on all of us. He talked about geophysics as being a dark art, and he was dead right. <laughs> Back in 1974, when I started studying archaeology, one of the books that influenced me, Landscape Archaeology, we talked about it yesterday briefly, uh, Mike Aston and Trevor Rowley. Um, this was one of the first textbooks I read, and it's a fantastic uh, book on landscapes. Not a single word on geophysics. <laughs> Not one. 1974. This is when he started to learn. <laughs> <laughs> he wrote dozens of books during his life. Almost as many as Francis. <laughs> Francis isn't here to hear the jokes, which is going to be... Oh, he is. <laughs> <laughs> I'll better be careful what I say, then. Um... losing bits of my slide, but basically Mick referred to geophysics as a dark art, but he actually understood geophysics from an early time. And he was one of the archaeologists that recognised what the techniques could do used correctly in the subject. <laughs> he advocated their use on a number of projects, and he talked about geophysics used in landscapes before we're actually doing that work, before we're capable of collecting large data sets. And he had a great influence. Um, his work at Shaftwick was quite revolutionary in many aspects. One thing that isn't perhaps highlighted is the use of geophysics. And his 1974 tome had no geophysics in it. And it came to the publication this little lightweight novel. <laughs> I think it comes in at 900 pages, about 24 kilograms in weight, um, and it's currently supporting a couple of my computer screens. <laughs> it had to have a use. <laughs> There's actually, I think it's about 10% of the book is on geophysics. <clears throat> it learned a lot. <laughs> During the time we worked with Mick, we worked on a variety of sites outside of Time Team. These were single sites. We did a project on Carthusian monasteries and looking at mounds in Somerset. This was one of the sites we thought we'd discovered, not with Mick, but doing work with the Royal Commission. And this was a what we thought was a lost barrow 
that we were looking for. And you can actually see part of the barrow in the top right hand corner. But what we found to our amazement was actually a hill fort um, with a series of roundhouses inside. Now, it's not often that you find hill forts. So we were quite high. We showed Mick results. He said, Oh, just a minute. I flew over that a few years ago. And he went out into the back room, pulled out the photograph, and there it was. We just hadn't got round to archiving it yet. <laughs> so we were beaten by him. <laughs> but working on the sites with Mick, we got some fantastic results. Um, here you can see the individual cells of the abbeys. Um, and it was a chance for us to demonstrate the power of the techniques. And again, this is from Axe Home, just a variety of plots on the resistance data. And then looking at larger sites, the mounds in Somerset, and detecting a whole range of archaeological features that nobody had actually seen before. Mick actually then reached the stage where he started teaching geophysics, which is quite remarkable. I, I think perhaps I should start teaching landscape archaeology. <laughs> um, Stuart would be the first person I'd talk to. <laughs> <laughs> but just to show that we've actually reached the stage uh, with an off-screen slide, where we're now looking at complete landscapes, 40 hectares, of data here, affected by a chart, seeing a whole variety of aspects from the geology, old field boundaries, pipes, and the odd nice archaeological feature. Again, never seen before. But enough of Mick, though he'll still feature, obviously. I'm now going to talk a bit about my involvement with the media. But before that, this video is from an early BBC programme telling you all about geophysics back in 1972. The whole problem is it's not going to work, so you're not going to be able to see the view. <laughs> somebody in a very posh accent, wearing a suit and a tie, um, explaining how geophysics was used in 1974. We were getting results on the screen instantly, different sorts of anomalies showing, um, <laughs> and different sorts of anomalies disappearing. <laughs> um, I think it's probably best if we go on to the next slide, to be honest. The part of the humour is actually in the way they present the geophysics. As it is this morning. <laughs> Francis, do you want to come back? <laughs> right, now I've got something on my screen here that is totally different to what's on there. So do I press it? Or... <coughs> I quite like a picture of archaeology against time. Um, sorry, I'm getting strange instructions to press the play video. ...which has developed a unique instrument. The device is called a flux gate radiometer. What it does is to detect the minute magnetic variations that occur wherever earth and rubbish have accumulated in the pits and holes and ditches dug by Iron Age men. All the scientist has to do is walk steadily to and fro over the ground carrying the instrument, and a pen recorder at the mobile recording station traces out every variation caused by odd things underground. This is very far from crude treasure hunting, and Tony can't describe what those wiggly lines mean. Uh, this is a montage of the traces produced by our plotting machine. Well, let's take one individual thing, something like that. What, what, what does that show? Yes, uh, well, a narrow, strong feature like that is probably a hearth or a kiln. Then what's this rather like a range of mountains across? Well, that's, that's the, the only time you can see. 
And uh, so, in fact, you want to sort of complete pictures of things. Yes, we have. It shows up all little pits and ditches and things that people dug. <coughs> so, so, really, one can get the whole idea of the archaeology of the site without any digging at all. Uh, now, can you just show the archaeologist where to dig, or is it an actual record of a site? Well, these days, um, uh, archaeologists have sufficient confidence in us to use our results <laughs> as a plan of the site. As well as showing them the interesting places. Yes, well, it shows them places to dig, and uh, also if they haven't got resources to dig the whole site, then uh, this will complete the plan for them. Well, this is what's happening here, isn't it? I mean, they can't possibly dig 20 acres. No, they're digging about half of it, and then they'll probably rely on our plan for the other half. So the real is placed away the topsoil that covers those parts of the field that the scientists have shown to be interesting. It all seems a bit crude, but this land has been farmed for centuries, and there's nothing in the topsoil of old days. But barely a foot below the surface, the first traces of Iron Age man appear. It's just a discovered area at first sight, and John Musty, the director of Ancient Monuments Laboratory, followed up immediately. Um, a bit, I would imagine. I can see it. <laughs> 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 rubbish pit? Could be. Could be. One of an earth on these sides. Possibly fully excavated. Well, how many of these um, rescue sort of surveys are you doing here? Yeah, 40 or 50. And is yours the only team in the country doing? We are the only full time unit, yes. Well, then, I mean, are there enough folks doing this sort of work to keep up? <laughs> well, clearly, we, we, we would like to, to expand our service, but uh, uh, by using automated methods, uh, uh, as you're seeing here, we are, to an extent, keeping up. But the spread of motorways and new housing and other developments is keeping the archaeologists and scientists working flat out, even to record the bare details of our past. The scientists can show the way, but it's always stayed in trouble when anything important is likely to turn up. The electronic devices, working so much faster than diggers, are essential just to cover the ground. More teams and more machines are necessary, according to many archaeologists. More teams and more machines. I've got something I've left myself. Uh, I mean, the time team couldn't really fail after that, could it? <laughs> Perhaps it could. This is a quick resume for those who haven't watched the programme. <laughs> should be a bit faster. six years before us and found absolutely nothing. Thanks, Mick, we thought, taking it to us a site where geophysics isn't going to work, our first time ever on time team. Fortunately, we got these results coming out of the back of the wagon and we didn't look back after that. Um, the reason English Heritage didn't get the results is because they did it in the middle of summer when the ground was dry. Um, we did it in spring, the soils were wet and the wall foundations were dry by contrast. And so we got these pretty nice results. <laughs> a nice start for the next 20 years. And over the next 20 years, <laughs> the centre of all time team has been the GFIS. <laughs> we, we didn't bother with the rest. You know, it's superfluous. But this sort of highlights the fact that GFIS become a bit of a joke. 
maybe it's something to do with me. <laughs> we do some survey work, nice flat sites, we were told by the researchers. <laughs> we dig some holes. So we go with a magnetometer, we find a blob, we look at the different traces, characteristic double peak, do some radar, dig a hole, put a camera down, find an intact medieval tile kiln. All within two hours, all live on television. If that's not exciting, well, you might as well go. <laughs> well, thinking about it, if Francis is next and then Stuart, that's another good reason for going. <laughs> So we do the survey, we have discussions, where are we going to put the hole? It's a long, hard decision-making event. Um, the archaeologist who wants to find certain things, the producer who wants to find gold, and myself who knows what's there, but no one will believe me. So we put the trench in. <laughs> so I know it's there. I tell them to keep digging. They eventually find it. <laughs> Channel 4 wanted to use, to use tried and tested techniques. Uh, as a scientist, I have an open mind, and so I consider all things except for dowsing, which is a total waste of time. <laughs> There's a few techniques we use then. Resistance surveys, my colleague, many of you will spot him, uh, Chris Gaffney, who worked on many of the programmes over the years. Um, good person to work with, except for the fact he supports Newcastle. But we all have our faults. Uh, this is a typical example of Time Team getting us to do the unusual, most people do geophysics before the excavation starts. Here we were doing it in the middle of the trench. Out in Spain, bone hard ground. We weren't going to find anything, but it was worth going to Spain. <laughs> you know all this, but it's just a quick summary. And just highlighting some of the difficulties we have. <coughs> a ditch. Originally, it gets filled, dry fill. The ditch, fill, and the fill is wet, so you get a high response in the one instance, and then you get a low response in the other. But they're still ditches, so how do you know when you're getting a high resistance feature whether it's a ditch or a wall? But they don't. You have to guess. But well, we got some nice results. Uh, one of the first live, of the first live program on the Time Team, Turk Team Roman Villa, and these are just some of the graphics. But they look fantastic to my mind. But to be honest, what Time Team wanted to do was go beyond showing data to actually doing reconstructions. And it was what the 3D graphics people did that brought things to life, as well as the excavations. But what people really wanted, like time, uh, Tim Taylor, the producer, he wanted mosaics. But who doesn't? These were the results. You can see the villa pattern, and you can see where we put the trench. Why didn't we put the trench in some of these rooms? Well, because we've got a solid resistance floor there, and that usually means mosaic. And you can see how close it was to the surface, and Tony talked about the excitement of recovering a mosaic, but it doesn't get much better, does it? Magnetometry, we use that widely on the program. It's the real workhorse. We get a range of responses, and I spoke briefly yesterday about this sort of classic response you get of a double peak over a kiln. And when I saw that at Tyler Kiln, the slide I showed earlier with the medieval kiln intact, that's when I got really excited because I knew that had to be a kiln. And 
you get different responses and they give you an idea of what's below the ground. Here is another instance. Uh, Roman settlement, you can see the streets, you can see the plots, and you can see these blobs as we came to call them. And in this instance, we selected this nice response um, and Phil dug a really nice small kiln. And again, that is, from my point of view, really good because I'm getting feedback on what the geophysics is trying to tell me. And I talked yesterday about getting a curved iron pipe. We don't normally expect that, but now I'm a bit more cautious when I come to interpreting results. Radar. Jimmy, who worked on the drone for 10 years, he's going to be out in the uh, complex today with some new kit. Go along and see him. Make jokes about him. He'll appreciate it. On the time team, we started using radar. And um, in green fields, because we got good results with magnetics and resistance, using radar in the middle of towns where the archaeology is difficult, um, it was difficult enough to understand the stratigraphy there. It's bad enough. So that means it's impossible to try and understand the geophysical results from such a complex situation. So using radar on greenfield sites proved advantageous. We not only got plans, Well, there was going to be a rotating model of the geophysics um, showing that we could get the depth information and see um, what was below the ground. Unfortunately, that's not worked. Time team weren't happy though, they wanted better and better, and so we had to go faster and faster. So we attached machines to vehicles. Mick unfortunately asked us to go and survey another 20 metre strip to the south 
to try and extend the picture. <laughs> we even got the penalty spot. <laughs> Visible on the ground. There were no goalposts there anymore. What had happened is um, they'd used lime to mark the white lines. This had affected the moisture content of the soil, and so we had a perfect plan of a football pitch. <laughs> we had a few jokes and mix. Mick, oh, upsidal building. <laughs> My well, apologies, I'm, I'm going to wind up now because I've lost all track of time. <laughs> I don't know how long my videos were playing for. Um, I just thought I'd end with a few explosive advisory slides. Um, this figure is instantly recognisable. In the early years of Time Team, the fans actually voted him as the sexiest person on the team. <laughs> Eat your heart out, Julian Richards, we also did the instructions. <laughs> like me, the ancestor, would you want an ancestor like him? <laughs> so, Phil came top in the vote. I actually got one vote, so I thought that's not bad for geophysics, I know my place. And the damn discovery got two votes. It wasn't all bad. How many geophysicists have ended up on the front cover of a highly read magazine? After 18 years, I'll go back a bit, um, of having had the fun taken out of us, in amongst the serious moments, um, Time Team actually decided to do a special on archaeological geophysics. An hour-long program just on archaeological geophysics. It was my chance to get my own back on everyone. Um, nobody to mess me around us on until they said Phil was going to be part of the program. And we had an interesting discussion about the value of geophysics, really archaeology. But they dug a hole, they dug 20 holes, put 20 different objects in, and challenged me to find them and say what was in the ground. Oops. Sorry about this. You probably can't read this at the back, but it sort of sums up things. Tony Robinson and geophysics boss, Boffin John Gator, examined the achievements of geophysics and the, put the latest technology to the test. Can it distinguish between a bike and a toilet? <laughs> between a bike and a toilet. There's a very good book out there, Francis, I can do this as well. Um, all proceeds go to Dig Nation. For those that want to buy a present to take home, well recommended. An extremely good read. For those that want to buy other presents, then can I recommend, if you can find a lush shop on Lindy's Farm, you go in there and buy yourself some luxury bath foam. <laughs> Also known as Geofit. <laughs> so the more observant might notice that the price is one pence. <laughs> it never stops, does it? <laughs> no. So it wanted sexy archaeologists. <laughs> but he 
didn't stand much chance, did we? <laughs> and then again. <laughs> is the only photograph where Phil takes his hat off. <laughs> I can't think why. <laughs> but it didn't work. Channel 4 wanted something different. <laughs> <laughs> and I bet their budget was bigger than ours. <laughs> We've lost the keys, a bit of script, well there it goes. <laughs> the couples were quizzed and they had an expert panel. I was quite disappointed I wasn't invited on the expert panel. <laughs> but I've run out of time. And I, I wanted to check that it was working first because I need to make an apology. No, seriously, I used some really bad language in this footage. I apologise in advance, but it's an actual event. I've been on Time Team for 13 years at this stage, and my biggest fear was, with all the people on site, that somebody would break our equipment, drop it, drive over it, or whatever. And in the 13th series, this is actually what happened. Um, the equipment is highly expensive, and we used it all the time in our normal work. And so the worry was, if something went wrong, what would happen? So with apologies for the language, you might notice this machine at the back there. Well, I was just filming a scene. Drove away, the magnetometer fell on the ground. Thank you. <laughs>